already know he's able to. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. El Shaddai, the one almighty. Jehovah Rapha. How many of you all know he's a healer today? How many of you really believe the boy God really is able? Don't, don't, let's just now play with God. Let's get real serious about God. How many of you all know that God really is able? He's able to heal. He's able to provide. He's able to save. He's able to redirect. How many of you all really believe that God is able today? So God, we come right now, Father. And Lord, we don't come, God, just to be here. We don't come, God, just because it's Sunday. We come, God, because we know, God, that you are real, Father. We come, God, because we know that you are able. And so, God, we all look real cute today. But, Lord, we don't feel real cute on the inside. And, God, as good as we look, God, things aren't that well in all of our lives. So, God, we need you to show up today, Father. We need you, Father, to do what only you can do, God. For some, God, it's relational. For some, God, it's medical. For some, God, it may be professional. For others, God, it may be their financial lives and their investments, Lord. For some, it may be their business, their neighbors, God, their, their automobile. But God, we need you, God, to be God today, Lord. And so, Lord, you're able. So I pray, God, that you would transform us. I pray, God, that you would reform us. I pray, God, you order our steps and speak to us today. It's in Jesus' name, I ask it all. Amen. Amen. Let's give our great God applause. Amen. Amen. If you can give me some more lead in these mics, please. Um, I ain't got a voice like John. I gave Jonathan my voice. And so, um, I mean, I know it was nice of me, but I gave him my voice. And so, <laughs> well, Happy New Year again. It's good to see you all. First things first, won't you all be praying for TCU? <laughs> they beat the University of Michigan, so they deserve to be champions this year. And so, uh, so if we can't do it, we, go, we want TCU to do it. So I want you all to be uh, praying for them um, on this week as well. Um, uh, and all fun and games. Um, don't know who the Cowboys are going to put on the field that they called me. I told them I said, I got to go to church and preach. So um, I'm not sure if that going to do it or not. I told them I couldn't do it. So anyway, we got the Cowboys going. Anyway, hope you all had a first, um, a, a great first week of your year. And um, it's been a great week for us here at Destiny Church and um, trying to equip you all. You know, my... My conviction, you know, the, 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 the older I get, I'm starting to get like my granny. You know how you get to a certain age, you just say anything that comes to your mind? <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there, right? And so, um, but it's time out for just playing church. And um, we sing about God, we talk about God, but we don't experience God. And then when things get tight, we don't exemplify God. And so I'm at a point now where I really want to equip people. I mean, I always kind of had that in mind, but I really want to do it now. I really want to equip people with God's word and want you all to live a different kind of life. Amen? Not just live, but like the scriptures say, live life more abundantly. And so God has called us to live an abundant life. I've really been praying about these first set of messages for this year, and I got redirected to this thing called winning big. Anybody want to win big? You know, maybe it's just my, my, my athletic pedigree, but um, I don't like to play sports. I like to win. <laughs> Smile at me. And so you probably wouldn't call me past on the court. You might call me some other stuff, <laughs> but it wouldn't be past. I'd be trying to knock your teeth out and go after that ball. I want to win. And I want to win big. And that same mindset comes with me when it comes to the Christian life. I really believe the scriptures when the scriptures say that he came that we might have life and have that life more abundantly. I really believe that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I really believe that God can do the impossible and that nothing is impossible with God. How many of y'all believe the scripture, the word of God? I really believe Paul in Ephesians 3 when he says, Now unto him who is able to do 
exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we can ask or think. I really believe Romans chapter 8 verse 1 where it says there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Then you come to the book in and he says the boy there is no separation. Neither height nor death, angels or principalities, things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then in the middle, he wants us to have life where he says there's no frustration. So 8.1 says there's no condemnation. At the end, he says there's no separation. And God wants to get rid of the frustration in the middle. How many of y'all really believe life like that? Amen? Amen? And so if we really believe that, then you ought to believe that when your life is not a supernatural life, it's an abnormal life. In other words, for us to be up under our circumstances is not where God has ordained us to be. God has ordained us to be victorious in him. Amen? Because 1 Corinthians says, blessed be God, because God has given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen? And so it's easy to say that, but it's not as easy to live that. And so how do you manage life when life is not lovable? How do you manage life when life is frustrating? How do you manage life when life does not feel good? How do you manage life when you do not seem to be winning? Or to ask it more succinctly, how do you manage life when you're overwhelmed? How do you overcome when you're overwhelmed? Now, it's easy to declare that you should not be overwhelmed, But when you are overwhelmed, then how do you manage life? And so I want to teach you all today how to win big even when you're overwhelmed. How to win big even when you're overwhelmed. Now, you all know by now I like sports, like watching um, these different um, sports teams. And you all know my favorite team is the best team ever, Uh, um, Alabama, right? Roll Tide, right? I'm not even a big football fan, but, but what I like is the dynasty that Nick Saban has perpetuated at Alabama. What I like is that, you know what, they have come in, but they learn how to win year after year. I mean, it's the best team money can buy. Smile at me. And they win every year. They recruit. They don't, they don't, they don't rebuild. They reload. Now, see, you know, how do you do that year after year after year? So this year wasn't our best year. But, boy, you wait till next year. It's going to be Alabama in the CFP game, right? So watch this now. What do you do in the Christian life when we sing about victory, we talk about victory, we talk about winning, but we're not winning? How do you manage that? What do you do when the family is not well, the job is not well, the profession is not well, your health is not well? What do you do when you don't seem to be winning? Number one, you've got to understand that God has declared you to be a winner. So no matter what your circumstances say, in Jesus Christ, you're a winner. Amen? Turn your Bible to the sticky pages again. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I know, yeah, it's in the Bible, it's the Old Testament, not, not 2 Corinthians, smile at me, 2 Chronicles, um, Samuel King's Chronicles, it's part of the, it's part of the um, Old Testament synoptics, Samuel King's and Chronicles. Samuel King's and Chronicles tell the story about Israel and how God worked in Israel's life. When I was growing up, the paper's not in existence anymore, but when I was growing up, we had a paper called the Michigan Chronicle. And what it would tell are the grassroots stories of Michiganders. It would, it would chronicle their life, chronicle their situations, chronicle their circumstances. Today we're in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I want to encourage you guys in your quiet time or your devotional time to read 2 Chronicles chapter 17 through 20. Ch- chapters, plural, 17 through 20. Chapter 17 through 20 encompass the ministry and the leadership of a guy by the name of Jehoshaphat. Can y'all say Jehoshaphat? 
Jehoshaphat. I know we don't talk about Jehoshaphat much. We don't, we don't quote Jehoshaphat, but he's an Old Testament figure who led in Israel. You all know that Israel had asked for a king, and so God said, I want to be your king, but Israel had asked for a king. And so God gave them their wishes, and they ended up with a divided kingdom. That kingdom was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You had one that was called Israel. You had one that was called Judah. And the tribes were divided among these two different divisions. This guy Jehoshaphat was over the kingdoms of what you call Judah. In chapter 17, 18, and 19, I think we can glean five things about Jehoshaphat's life. Number one, we can glean that, that Jehoshaphat was a follower of God. We read in chapter um, 16 um, about his dad, Asa. We read about how his dad did not follow God full heartedly, but yet he was still in leadership. Then we see in chapter 17 that Jehoshaphat kind of went a different direction from his dad. What's the point there? The point there is that you don't have to follow the same negative example as your forefathers or your foreparents. Amen? You, God can lead you in a different direction. So to suggest that your life is cursed and you got to live a negative life because somebody in your ancestors lived a negative life, that's not biblical. That's an excuse. Because Galatians 3.14 says, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. You are not living up under a curse in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Any person that's in Christ is a new creation. Um, um, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So to say you're under a curse is to deny the power and the reality of your salvation in Jesus Christ. Don't argue with experience. Argue with the word of God. Jehoshaphat was a follower of God. Number two, Jehoshaphat was a fierce warrior. As you read chapters 18 and 19 in um, 2 Chronicles, you will read about how Jehoshaphat and them, they overcame a number of armies that were around them. You'll also see that Jehoshaphat had fame among the surrounding nations. So much so they didn't want to come around him, but he was a bad boy. He's like Aaron, he like Aaron Rodgers for Green Bay. He was a bad boy, right? They didn't want to fool with Jehoshaphat and his army for the most part. We also see that Jehoshaphat, he feared the Lord and had courage for God. Well, how do you know that? Because when you read here, he dealt what they call the high places. That's where they did idol worship, and they worshiped other gods and offered sacrifices to other gods. And it said that, that, that Jehoshaphat dealt with most, he should have dealt with all, but most of the high places. Number five, you'll see where he fortified his kingdom. He was a good leader, and he had put people in places to lead effectively there. But what's interesting is when you come to Second Chronicles chapter 20, and these words are found. After the Moabites and Ammonites and with them some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. So, boy, after all these attributes about Jehoshaphat, as, 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 as much as he feared God, he had fame, he fortified his kingdom, he was a fear of God, he walked with God, he still had opposition. Why do you say that? I say that because very often we feel like you ought to get to a point in the Christian life that if you serve God faithfully, you should not have opposition. But the reality is your opposition is sometimes proof you are for God. He goes on here and says in verse 2, it says, Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great, a, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. From beyond the sea, and behold, they are Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. The Jehoshaphat was afraid. Who was afraid? Then Jehoshaphat, hold on now. Why was Jehoshaphat afraid? He was a fierce warrior. He had fame. He feared the Lord. He fortified his army. He had fame among the tribes. Why in the world is he afraid? It shows us that sometimes life has a way where opposition is so strong, you can become afraid. It says in verse 3, that Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So now we come here and we come to this place and now we are reading about how do you deal with life when you are overwhelmed? Or to say it a different way, how do you overcome when you're overwhelmed? 
I want to give you guys a process to prevail when you are overwhelmed. I want to encourage you guys to take notes. I want to encourage you guys to type it into your iPad. Type it into your iPhone. If you don't need it right now, put it in for you. Because one day, you're going to need it. Amen? In this pericope, the children of Israel are overwhelmed with fear, with dismay, and with doubt. Because three different groups are planning to attack them. And so now in the midst of this attack, that it's not a surprise attack because someone came and announced the attack to them and told them to be on the lookout and be ready because you are about to be attacked. And so in verses 1 and 2, you see God's people being attacked by, by these three different groups, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Mennonites, and a fourth group, everybody else who wasn't right. Smile at me. In verses 3 through 11, you see God's people approach God. How do you respond when you are being attacked? Do you go load your guns? Do you go call your partners? Do you go see who you can um, um, scrounge up to be on your side? Do you try to go and get people just to vote present so you can get the vote? <laughs> so, so some of y'all here, y'all catch the house already. <laughs> How many of y'all stayed up and watched the process? No matter where you are, it was just an interesting process. No matter where you are politically, it was an interesting process to write, to, to watch. You know, you know what came to my mind? Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, what came to my mind is don't we read the Bible when it says a house, even the House of Representatives, if it's divided against itself, it cannot stand. We have to be careful in America. But whether we're Democrat, we are, we are Republican, we're still the, you, I'm sorry, the divided states of America. <laughs> and a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so we don't need anybody else to take us out, we're taking ourselves out. Verses 12 through 13, you see God's people's affirmation. They give affirmation of who God is and what God has said. In verses 14 through 17, you see where God comes and God advises his people. In verses 18 to 21, you see God's people now are advised by Jehoshaphat on what to do. And then in verses 22 through 24, God ambushes the enemy of his people. In verses 25 through 30, what you see is God's people praise him. Amen. After that victory. And then in verses 31 through, through, through the end of the chapter, 30, um, verse 37, you see a summary of Jehoshaphat's leadership. I want to share with you guys today about God's people, God's principles, God's promises, God's prescription, and God's praise. You all should get home right when the game comes on at 325. Amen. <laughs> God's people, what's interesting here when you read this pericope, what's interesting here is that you see people whom have had victory, people who have, for the most part, served God, walked with God, for the most part, have lived for God, for the most part, have done what God has called them to do, but yet you see these people now are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed because the reality and the vicissitudes of life Position you in a position to where even though if you're not at fault, ugly, wicked, nasty, and or hurtful stuff can happen to you even when you're doing what you're supposed to do. That's the reality of living in a fallen world. So now we're here and we're here with Jehoshaphat and the, and the um, tribes of Judah and now they feel overwhelmed because they hear about the Moabites, the, uh, the, the um, Ammonites and the Meunites about to come against them. And now they have become fearful. They are afraid. Why are they afraid? They're afraid because they're about to be attacked. They're afraid because they heard America has, 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 has sent the Patriot missiles over. They're about to come at you to try to defeat what you got going on. They're afraid because the army is about to come against them. They are disillusioned. You see here at some point between verses 5 and 11, they basically say a prayer to God, but in the midst of their prayer, they basically say, God, didn't you, didn't you, didn't you? And they basically know that we are disillusioned because of our current circumstances. 
in light of what you have said, God, in light of what we have done, Lord, why in the world are we encountering this? Don't you ask that question sometimes? Lord, 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 you know what, Lord? I ain't been perfect, but God, I got 9 out of 10. I got 8 out of 10. Well, Lord, I got 7 out of 10, Lord, already. Watch this now. Lord, why is this happening in my life in light of how I've been serving you, I've been giving to you, I've been reading your word, I've been praying to you. Lord, why in the world is this happening in my life? They are disillusioned, but they've also become distracted. How they become distracted? They became distracted because they were tempted to take their eyes off Jesus and put their eyes on their circumstances. We do well when our eyes are on Jesus, but we don't do as well when we put our eyes on our situations. And guys, these are not the enemies of God. These are the people of God who are overwhelmed, who are fearful, who are disillusioned, who are distracted, and who are about to be attacked. Either you are in a battle, you just finished a battle, or you're on your way to a battle. But I can promise you, you need to be battle ready. So what are God's principles from 2 Chronicles chapter 20? God comes to the deliverance of his people, watch this now, who have deviated from him when they fully devote themselves to him. How many of y'all ever heard of Facebook? Okay, I'm just checking. Um, y'all ever seen these reels on Facebook? And how you know, but you could be watching one reel, did it take you across the world to another reel someplace else? I was watching a reel, uh, I think it was yesterday or before yesterday, and I saw one, it said, Holy Spirit. So, 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 boy, I, um, I took it off mute and I listened to it, and it was a Pentecostal preacher saying that you all cannot believe the myth that God does not dwell in unclean places. Because you all heard the myth that, you know what, God don't dwell in unclean places. And I, he, he said, well, you know what, if God doesn't dwell in unclean places, he would never dwell in humanity. Because humanity is not totally clean. Psalm 51 says, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If God can who can say, come to us reason together, though your sins be as cockroach. I mean, if God does not dwell in dirty humanity, he could not dwell among humanity at all. And the beauty about this passage is that, boy, you don't have to be perfect for God to work with you. You don't have to have all the boxes checked for God to love you. You don't have to have every... Now, boy, I'm not trying to promote an a, a ungodly lifestyle. I'm not trying to promote a lascivious lifestyle. I'm not trying to promote an a, 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 a ungodly lifestyle. But what I am saying is that when you found yourself there, you don't have to give up on life because God will not give up on you. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He's able. Uh, he's able. Watch this now. We often think that, boy, you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You've got to be at a certain place before God will exercise his mercy and his grace toward you. It almost becomes a conundrum. A conundrum in the sense that, you know what, you've got unholy people relating to a holy God. You've got unholy people who've got expectations from a holy God. You've got disobedient people who need God to show up and deliver them. It might be a conundrum, but it's still true. That even when you have deviated, when you decide you want to walk with God, serve God, live for God, God's going to open up his arms and say, come on home, child. I'm still your daddy. I'm still your mama. I'm still your papa. I still love you, and you still belong to me. Amen? You all have heard the story about the prodigal son. And boy, when, when the father heard he was coming back home, the father got excited. Principle number two, God comes to the deliverance of his people because of his providence. We don't use that term providence anymore. It's kind of a Presbyterian term. It's kind of an older term that we used to use. It's called providence. Can y'all just say it just sounds good? Providence. All right. This, this word providence. Providence says that, boy, there are some things that God has ordained for your life. 
There are some things that God has ordained for your life that you nor the devil in hell can stop it. Are we tracking together? See, um, you have the desires of the Lord, and then you have the decrees of the Lord. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Those are the desires of the Lord. But then there's some things that, boy, like in, um, what is it? Um, I think it's Job, um, Job 51, I'm sorry, Job 42. It says that, boy, that the purposes of God cannot be thwarted. Those are the decrees of God. See, some of you all went, well, boy, why do I have what I have? And women, You know what? That's because that's how God ordained it. That's because that's how God, you think you deserve everything you got? You think, you, you think you've earned the privileges, the opportunities, the doors that you have? You know, I was watching Subbo Sports the other day, and they were talking about these athletes. And um, they said, you know what? Um, no, matter, no matter how skilled you are, at some point in time, God's got to endow you and bless you with certain abilities to be a professional athlete. I think I was watching uh, Neon Dion, primetime Dion, right? You got to be gifted with certain abilities to perform at that level. Otherwise, we all be pro. Smile. We all be signing them contracts, right? Smile at me. Watch this now. God provides, God comes to the of his people because of his right. God comes to the of his people through his protection. So we see in this story here where, in 2 Corinthians 20, we see in this story where, 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 where they're about to be attacked. They're about to be, they're about to be jumped on. You know, kind of in my neighborhood, I, I grew up in the hood in Detroit, smile at me. And uh, you had these, you had these, you had this one, it, 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 was, it was one large family, it was called a Rest Press family. And they was a huge family, but you didn't mess with the Rest Press family because the Rest Press family, they was huge. And boy, I mean, boy, I mean, boy if you saw one, you saw 200 of them. All right, boy, boy, you just did, you didn't fool with the Rush Press family, right? And so I ain't going to tell the rest of that part because y'all think I'm crazy. Well, I'll tell you the rest of the story. One day, they, they made me mad. They made me mad. It made me mad. It made me real mad. It made me mad. But what I'm, was bothering me, I said, I'm tired of this. I feel like Jehoshaphat. <laughs> I ain't walking around in fear. I don't care who your daddy is. I don't care. I turn around, man. Bam! I hit him as hard as I could. I said, oh, Lord, I hit the rest press kid. <laughs> it was a six-foot gate, boy. I, I leaped it like Superman in, in one single bound. <laughs> I ran to the house, boy, as fast as I could. And um, I stayed away from the park for a couple of days. I did a record, but they were going to be looking for me. And then I finally got word of release. They say, man, they really respect you. They say, because, man, wouldn't nobody else in the hood do that? But you stole on him, and you safe. <laughs> My daddy was also the police. Smile at me, all righty. And you didn't want to fool with the dude whose daddy was the police, all righty. Watch this now. Sometimes our daddy protects us. Sometimes our daddy looks out for us. Sometimes, not because you're right, but because your daddy loves you, your daddy cares for you, you belong to your daddy, your daddy will protect you. And so what you see here is the children of Israel, the tribes of Judah were going to be protected, not because they had done right, but because they belonged to God and God wanted to protect his children. How many of y'all know it pays to be a child of God? Amen. It really does pay that, that, boy, God knows you by name and you serve him and you walk with him. And, boy, as imperfectly as you do, you still belong to him. You still his child. Number three, God comes to live of his people through his protection. Number four, God comes to live of his people when they passionately pray to him. So now it's the start that you hear people all over the country, but they, they're praying, they're fasting, we're trying to twist God's arm. God, if I miss a meal, will you give me a new deal? And God is saying, I don't function like that. Don't try to manipulate me. I can see through all that stuff you're trying to do. You might as well go ahead and eat your food. Because you're just missing a meal. We call that an intermittent diet, not a biblical fast. Because, boy, a biblical fast is supposed to reposition your heart towards God primarily. 
It's supposed to change your disposition towards God. It's not supposed to be, Lord, this is my lucky day. Give me a car. Give me a house. Give me a family. Give me a husband. You know what, Lord? Lord, Lord, make me over. Lord, get me closer to you. Lord, advance your kingdom purposes. Lord, put me in alignment with what your will is. God, let me hear clearly from you. So I think probably this week was so powerful because you had the people of God fasting and praying. Y'all were fasting, weren't y'all? Well, y'all was eating that food Friday. <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, he wants us to come passionately and pray to him. You know, what's interesting is that some fast ought to be spontaneous. And so if we're going to do authentic fast, you say, you know what, see, you're just going to fast the first few days of the year and that's it. And God don't lead you at no point in time through the rest of the year to fast. I mean, life is so good the rest of the year where it's not necessary to fast. But the reality is when you're really burdened and, boy, you're really seeking God, you're really hearing from God, you're really before God, sometimes you go into a spontaneous fast because all you want to do is pray, read his word, and worship, and you automatically pass up on the meal. Are we tracking together? So what are... What are God's principles? God, God comes to deliverance of his people because of his providence, because of his protection. When we passionately pray to him, but what, what are God's promises? When you, when you read through here, it's a, you know what I'm saying? Well, Lord, how do I summarize? Well, it's um, it's uh, 37 verses. And Lord, we don't read that many verses on Sunday morning. Lord, we don't read that many verses all week combined. All right, so how are we going to read 37 verses in one setting? And so I said, you know what? I think it comes down to three things that we see about God, at least three things in this, in this chapter. Number one is God's prominence. Um, God overcomes what overwhelms us because he is over us and what overwhelms us. Let me read it again to you. Let me slow down. God overcomes what overwhelms us because he is over us and what overwhelms us. And we often assume that if we're afraid, God's afraid. We assume that if with our smart selves, if we're concerned, God is overly concerned. If we're on edge, then God must be on edge. If we're disillusioned, then God must be. If our resources can't cover it, it must not be able to be covered. But what God does is give us a reminder every once in a while that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. You know, God did it again this past Monday, didn't he? You say, what, what, what happened Monday, Pastor? Monday night football. <laughs> if you don't watch, you heard about it. If you're alive, you heard about it. Monday night football, they're sitting there playing a the game. I think it was the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. And we were up here, so I didn't catch the whole thing on what happened. I just turned the TV on, and the game was on pause. I'm like, what in the world happened? Somebody get shot? Uh, I mean, you know, man, somebody come on the field. I mean, you know, what happened? Somebody broke their leg. I mean, what? and so you boy, you're sitting there watching. I'm sitting there trying to go on Twitter and Instagram. I'm trying to find out what the story is and the news. But what in the world just happened? And I found out that what happened was the guy made a tackle and he got up and then he fell again. And they didn't know it later, but he went into cardiac arrest. Now, what's interesting is that is that that had a domino effect, didn't it? The domino effect was you had all of a sudden you had people who probably wasn't thinking anything about God an hour earlier. Many people who probably didn't even confess God an hour earlier. Many people who surely weren't going to church, worshiping God, serving God, living for God an hour earlier. Now all of a sudden you got everybody on their knees praying. Isn't it interesting how God can interrupt our circumstances? And remind us that apart from him, we are nothing. And, the, and, that, and that we are merely dust. And so God came to you know what? Y'all going to pause all this. And that I, 
Y'all say, y'all atheists, let's see how atheist you are when a crisis comes your way. Even the atheists when they need prayer. <laughs> <laughs> now, boy, I'm not laughing at the guy's situation, but I was praying for the guy as well. I could care less if he was a believer or not believer. At that point in time, he needed prayer. And I'm saying, God, help that man. God, help his family. Lord, be with him. God, restore him. I found myself throughout the day. I couldn't even remember his name. I'm snatched. Lord, you know the dude's name. Lord, Lord, help that dude. Lord, Lord, raise him up, oh, Lord. Lord, give him his breath back. Lord, help him. But, boy, isn't it interesting that there's something on the inside of us that when life reaches its most inopportune time that we look to God? God has created us with a void on the inside of us. And that void will never be filled until we are aligned with God. It's God's prominence. Are we tracking together? It's God's prominence. And so now all across the country, people are praying and but people are calling upon God. Let me hurry because I got lots of to cover. We ain't got much time. You also see in this passage is God's presence. God's presence. You know, God's presence is a difficult, a difficult concept because we are trained for stuff that aligns itself with our five senses. We can hear, we can smell, we can taste, what we can touch, what we can feel, right? But when it comes to God's presence, God's presence doesn't fall into those five categories so then how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you um, communicate his presence? And there's a supernatural aspect about serving God. And the challenge is that even in our schools, they do this thing called naturalism. And then they were, you cannot believe in anything that's not natural. You cannot believe in anything that, that through experiment, it cannot be reproduced so you really can't believe in God because we, quote, unquote, cannot reproduce him. We cannot reproduce his effect. We cannot, we cannot see him, but yet he's still present. How can we believe in that? So even among mature believers and followers of Christ, there's this thing called the presence of God. And, I, and but, you know, I can't explain it to you. I can just tell you about it, and hopefully one day you'll experience it. It's just something about knowing when God is with you. There's something about the reassurance that, that God is affirming what you're doing. There's something about big brothers. And you know what? Even though you cannot see him, God is there. Even though you cannot touch him, he's right there within a hand's reach. Even though he does not speak audibly, he speaks extremely loud. And so you read through here, it's his presence. It's his promise. And then, and then it's his power. God has the power to sustain his people and subdue his people's problems. You know, let me tell you the hard thing about trusting God's power. It takes a certain level of humility. We're not trained to be humble. We're trained to be self-sufficient. We're trained to be self-adequate. We're trained to rely upon ourselves. We're trained to go, when a speaker's busted, we're trained to go cut it off. Okay. Uh, you got to come find the button, and you got to cut it off. There we go. Don't that sound better? All righty. Y'all good? All righty. I mean distract y'all, but that was distracting me. All righty. And so why? And so, but we are trained, we are trained, we are trained to trust in our own power. We are trained to trust in our own knowledge. We're trained to rely upon ourselves. We're trained to rely upon and depend upon our own personal responsibility. But there comes a point in life where it says that man's extremity is God's opportunity. And God brings us to a point we have to depend upon him. Monday night, there was nothing we could do to save that young man's life. My wife and I received a text from one of our old church members and says one of our old church members got into a really bad motorcycle accident. And that boy, it, it, um, it fractured his spine, it fractured some bones in his leg, it fractured some bones in his face. But right now, they were just trying to make sure his brain and all that kind of stuff was functioning properly. One of those situations that only God can resolve. 
God's people, God's principles, God's promises. Here's the prescription. What do you do when you're overwhelmed? This thought came to mind this morning. When it rains, it pours. But because he rains, he pours out his grace. How many of y'all agree with that? That sometimes when it rains, <laughs> it pours. But because he reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S, he reigns forever, he reigns forever. <laughs> Boy, I can't wait to, you think my voice sounds good now, you wait till I get to heaven. <laughs> you wait till I, I ask you for two spots. And uh, smile at me already. Watch this now. Because he reigns, he pours out his grace. So what do you do when you come to a point in time, you're overwhelmed, and you don't know what to do? If you all would bear with me, he picks up here in verse 3. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. This was an individual gathering. It was a solemn assembly. It was everybody coming together, calling upon the name of the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh Lord, so now he's praying. He said, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule, you reign, over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand, our power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. That's his prominence. Verse 7, did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham for your friend? Of, I mean, of Abraham, your friend, that's his, that's his, that's his providence. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before the house and before you, for your name is in the house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. That's his protection. And now behold the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. It's a great lesson in that passage. It's interesting. The people who you often hurt the most, I'm sorry, help the most, are the ones who turn around and hurt you. Okay, we'll keep going. Verse 12, O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? Will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless. That's the being overwhelmed. We are powerless against the great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. It's old saying, sometimes you don't know where you're going, but you need to know who you're following. Sometimes you don't need to know or you don't know where you're going, but you need to know who you're following. So what is God's prescription? What does God want you to do when you recognize the odds are against you? What are you to do when you're overland, overwhelmed by life and or the enemy? Number one, you need to keep your eyes on God. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? But when you're afraid, when you're scared, when you're disillusioned, when you know you're about to be attacked, when you can't figure out what to do, one of the hardest things in the world is to keep your eyes on God. That's the most unnatural thing to do when you're about to be under attack and when you're overwhelmed is to keep your eyes on God. Keep your hand here and turn to Matthew. Y'all good? Turn to Matthew 14.
We're almost done. Get you guys home in time. I canceled second service so y'all could be here. <laughs> Matthew 14, verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. If Jesus went to pray, what do you think we ought to do? When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by waves, for the wind was against them. And in the um, fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the, but when the disciples saw him walk on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come on in. He said, Come. So Peter got out the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Watch this now. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to, to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got to the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let me ask you a question. When did Peter begin to sink? When he took his eyes off Jesus. You can do some extraordinary stuff when your eyes are on Jesus. But when you take your eyes off Jesus, when I take my eyes off Jesus, we're in trouble. Number one, God's prescription to overcoming when you're overwhelmed is to keep your eyes on God. Number two, it's to stand firm, exercise faith. Y'all stay with me in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. Oh, God, I got to read that right. Verse 13. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with all their little ones, their wives, and their children. Remember, they called fast around verse 5. See, we all go come together. We all go. They brought everybody. They're slaying everybody. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of um, Benet. He could have saved some. He could have saved some space, just put the, the initials. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon J, and the son of Z, the son of B, the son of J, the son of M, a Levite of the sons of A in the midst of the assembly. Verse 15. And he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord to you, watch this now, do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde. What do you mean, don't be afraid? And what do you mean, don't be dismayed? And these three major groups of people who come in to attack us. He says, he didn't say don't fear because they aren't treacherous. He didn't say don't fear because you had an army to protect you. He didn't say don't fear because you had a strategy to defend yourself. He said, don't fear because the battle was not yours. It's the Lord's. What? Lord, they ain't coming after you. <laughs> Lord, you aren't the one being attacked. Lord, you're not the one who's about to take these bullets. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the battle is not yours, but God's. When you belong to God and you align with God and you call upon God, what you thought was your battle is really the Lord's battle. But the question becomes, do you trust God not to fight your battle, to fight his battle? The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Remember over in Acts chapter 9, when um, Saul was going and, boy, he was taking captive the people of Israel. He was taking them to kill him. And, boy, he had a letter to go kill him. And then God struck him down. And he said, um, he says, why kickest thou against the pricks? 
And they asked, you know, why are you fighting against me? Because God identified with the people so closely that Saul wasn't really just fighting against the people. He was really fighting against God. The battle was not yours. It's the Lord's. I told you guys the most important thing in the world is the why. It's the will of God. And when you're walking in the will of God and you're doing what God wants you to do and you're pursuing God, you're walking with God, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. But our instinct is to fight. Our instinct is to defend ourselves. I mean, that's common sense, right? But God said, I don't want you functioning with common sense. I want you functioning with God sense. Y'all still with me? I'm slowing down because I don't want y'all to miss it. Verse 15, and he said, listen, all Judah and have of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of J, Jeruel. You will not need to fight. What? You will not need to fight in this battle. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not. Why does he repeat it? Because it's unbelievable. I can't believe what you just said. So let me say it again. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. That's his presence. Number one, God wants you to keep your eyes on him. Number two, God wants you to stand firm and exercise faith. Isn't it hard to wait on God? I don't think my mic working. Isn't it hard to wait on God? Isn't it hard to trust God to fight the battle for you? How many marital arguments do we get into because we don't want to wait on God to convict their heart? <laughs> My point is proven. Um, <laughs> stand firm. Watch this now. To stand firm, you have to have faith in God. God, they're coming at us. They're coming to kill us and our kids. It says the, the text says their wives and their children with them. You mean stand still, sit back, and do nothing when they come kill me and my whole family? Exactly. Because the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And one of the hardest things about trusting God is trusting God's ways. Because God's ways are not our ways. Number three, you've got to hold your position. Look at verse 16. Y'all good? He said, verse 16, he says this. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up um, of the ascent, east of the wilderness of, of um of Jeruel, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. One of the fallacies about spiritual warfare is that it's about taking on new territory. It's about going and get something that doesn't belong to you. It's about going to secure something that's not yours. I'll turn real quick to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I want y'all to know that the media team is in the spirit today because there ain't no clock up there. So I know they spirit filled today. God bless y'all. Um, God keep you <laughs> in my prayer. Ephesians 6, you guys there? Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. This word might here, it's not dunamis. It's, it's some iskus. And iskus means, it means power that originates with God. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Maybe to be able to, oh, there's our word. May be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as, and, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith of which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supp supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me and to open up my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Victory in spiritual warfare is not taking on new territory. Victory in spiritual warfare is holding your position that God has already given to you. Ephesians 1, 3 says he's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What God has ordained for you, God has already set forth. It's a matter now of you hanging on to what God's given to you. Number three, I'm sorry, number three, you've got to hold your position. You've got to exercise fortitude. Number two, you've got to stand firm. You've got to exercise faith. Number one, you've got to keep your eyes on God. Lastly, you've got to see the salvation of the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Father. Peter did well until he took his eyes off Jesus. God's people, God's principles, God's promises, God's prescription, and lastly, God's praise. Y'all good? Verse 18, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. You know, how do, how do we get around kneeling down and coming to our knees sometime in worship? I know, I know, I know. Well, Pastor, you know, that's what charismatic folks do. That's what uneducated folks do. That's what uncool folks do. But, boy, how do you get over? You're so overwhelmed with God and what God has done that sometimes you're not just so humbled. You get down on your knees and tell God, thank you. How, how have we come to the point where, you know what, you know what, you know what, you can worship God and you can, you can, you can exclaim his glory without verbalizing his glory. How do you do that? Verse 19, and the Letites and, and the Levites of the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, watch this now, with a very loud voice. They rose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. That was Kansas. And when they went out, um, Jehoshaphat, that's a joke, y'all. Smile at me. Um, um, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and heavens of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, <laughs> for steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, watch this now, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. Watch this now. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. I thought y'all came to fight together. They came together and started fighting against one another. Devouring them, de de devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. Look at God. God caused the people who were coming to fight against you to destroy themselves. But it came from trusting. So, well, let me give you three reasons to praise God. I'm going to take my seat. Number one, praise God for the faith to trust in his deliverance. Keep your eyes on God. Praise God for his faithfulness to deliver. 
How many of y'all believe that God can deliver? My eyes are on you, God. Praise God for the fruit of his deliverance. It goes on here, and um, I won't take you there, but it's a link back over to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, where it talks about how they had um, picked up the gifts. And uh, when they would go and destroy a place, they would take their property as the fruit of their victory. They called it their war booty, B-O-O-T-Y. And boy, um, you see that, boy, they have that here. And boy, it was a lot of it. It took them a day or two to pick up everything. Say, why is that? Because their enemies had come to stay, not come to leave. But God turned things around. What do you do when you're overwhelmed? You've got to know that God can overcome what overwhelms you question becomes, will you keep your eyes on him? Will you hold your ground? Will you stand still? And will you watch the salvation of the Lord? It's for you. Now, I didn't want you all to get emotionally excited to where you missed the message. I want you guys to write these things down because I promise you, as Granny used to say, just keep living. He's going to attack you. You're going to feel overwhelmed. And the question becomes, what are you going to do practically when you're overwhelmed? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come now, Lord. And we ask God that, Lord, you would help us to trust in you when we're overwhelmed. We pray, God, that, Lord, you would order our steps we pray, God, that we have the faith not to trust in our means, but to trust in what you and you alone can do. I want to pray, God, we keep our eyes on you. It's in Jesus' name, I pronounce it all. Amen.